I think that we can model some of the bridge building that I'm going to talk about. Um, I represent uh, several different conflict resolution and peace building institutions, as you just mentioned, and so do you. And so this is part of learning from each other. And I'm looking forward to learning more about what you're doing as well. Before we open that conversation up, though, I want to share some about some of the experiences that I've had and also um, give us a little bit of a conceptual framework to think about the role of um, faith-based actors and non-state actors in peace building. Um, so as, as, as you mentioned, I, I teach at UMass Boston in our conflict resolution program. Uh, we have the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance. And it's been really exciting to be a part of that community, which is very diverse. We have people from all over the world, different, um, different groups on all metrics. And to be in a room and learning from people who have such different backgrounds is exciting, because that's part of what builds peace, when we can understand each other in our own terms. Um, I want to open by describing a, a scenario from a program that I run in Ecuador uh, called the Summer Institute on Conflict Transformation Across <coughs> Borders. And this is the second year that we've done that program in Ecuador. It's a, a three-week institute that brings together people from all over the world. We've had 12 countries represented so far. Um, and it is learning about um, peace building, especially in border areas with migrants and refugees and transnational environmental conflicts and things like that. Um, and we visit sites. Um, we met with refugees both in Quito and on the northern border. We crossed the bridge um, right over to Colombia and came back um, and learned about uh, peace building there. So last year in the, the first summer institute, we visited the Mennonite Church's Colombian Refugee Project in Quito. So clearly a faith-based actor in Quito is doing really important work uh, for people who are fleeing the violence in Colombia and coming into Ecuador. And I, I brought this group, international group of people into the church space. We all sat on little narrow wooden benches in a big circle together with the refugees and the church staff and people from the congregation there. And in this forum, we invited people to share some of their experiences and just kind of talk to each other and learn from each other. And some of the refugees there described the experience of coming to Ecuador uh, because they were fleeing for their lives from the violence in Colombia. The paramilitaries had threatened them that if they weren't gone from their house by the next morning, they would be killed. Or the guerrilla, the FARC uh, guerrilla. Uh, and so they had come across to Ecuador not knowing anybody, not having anything other than what they could carry in their hands, and this was where they ended up. They reached out to people with similar faith that they had, or maybe not. In some cases, they heard through the grapevine, you can go here and they'll help you. And so there were lots of reasons people ended up here, but for whatever reason they were here. Some of them described the heartbreak of discrimination and social exclusion that they encountered once they got to Ecuador. They were expecting peace and found a different kind of a xenophobic response, including sometimes in the church, right? Um, churches are not exempt from these phenomena. Um, but they also found friends and allies and talked about the support that they had found in the Mennonite church there and in their neighborhoods. Um, they told how a person who has experienced trauma longs for peace and support and affirmation. And that's what they found in this new faith community that they were establishing in Quito. Uh, the visit also turned into a really interesting reciprocal exchange of experiences. Because after the Colombian refugees shared their stories, some of our participants said, well, actually, I've got a story I'd like to share. So we had a, a participant from Haiti who is a law student here in the Boston area. And she shared how her immigrant experience in the US had a lot of parallels with some of what the, the folks in Ecuador were saying. And she also shared some of the strategies that had worked for her in order to reach out and be included in the host community here. And she told about how important the church was to her 
as a way of integrating into society. And actually, while we were in Quito, she sought out a, a group of Haitian uh, refugees that were in a church, a little tiny Haitian church, and she went and interviewed them and talked with them and established a link that she still keeps in touch with them. We had a Muslim participant in our group from Indonesia who also said, well, you know, I, I'm not part of the same faith community, but my faith also has been an instrumental way that people see me as an immigrant and in, an uh, international student in the US. He's one of our masters, he was one of our master's students in, in UMass Boston. And he said that uh, the experience of confronting fear and stigmatization as a Muslim in this sort of post 9-11 uh, period of anti-Islamic political discourse in the US um, had actually been a motivation for him to turn pain into a determination to make a difference. And so that was what motivated him to study at a graduate level conflict resolution. And he shared that as a way of encouraging Colombians who had experienced similar stigmatization and fear on the part of the host community and said, uh, you can turn that into something good. Uh, finally, the director of this Colombian refugee project um, who is now one of my doctoral students at UMass Boston um, and was a participant in our summer institute, actually used some of the contacts and connections that he made through our summer institute to organize a follow-up peer training that brought a group of Colombian women called the Mariposas um, to Ecuador to do a peer training for refugees in Ecuador, taught them about early warning systems, human rights activism, um, gender, and community development and a whole host of things. And that event further strengthened the network of NGOs in Ecuador among faith-based, secular NGOs and, and the communities, you know, refugees and, and others. And so one intervention can have ripple effects that keep going. Um, and so we're, what we're doing in these interventions is weaving a, a sort of a fabric of connection, getting people to realize how much they have in common that they may not have realized before. Uh, so I wanted to open with that kind of vignette to give us a, a context of the kinds of stuff that we're talking about. So when we talk about faith-based organizations and their role in peace building, there are several kind of categories of types of organizations that would be involved here. Uh, one we can call sort of advocacy or human rights organizations. So examples of this would be the American Friends Service Committee, the, the Quakers, Serpas in Latin America and Ecuador is an example, the Jewish Voice for Peace is an example that does advocacy around Israel-Palestine injustice there. So these are groups that are pushing for accountability, trying to change policies and systems. And they're doing it rooted in a particular belief system based on their faith. Um, another category that we can talk about are human humanitarian relief and development organizations. Um, examples would be Catholic Relief Services, or Samaritan's Purse, or the Aga Khan Foundation, maybe. So these are groups that take seriously the idea of structural violence, that violence is not just a physical attack on somebody, but also all the institutions, inequality that reproduce harm against some people more than other people. So economic inequality, um, geographic marginalization of people, those kinds of things. So they're working to improve people's lives because they know that that helps to um, elevate folks to a point where they can reconcile as well. Structural violence often reproduces direct um, a, a third category is those involved in nonviolence education. So it occurs to me that the work that the Dalai Lama does would fall into this category. Um, Eastern Mennonite University as, a, as an academic institution does a lot of this kind of work. Um, down the street, I understand you guys have a, a partnership with the, um, the Street Workers Program and the, the um, Institute for Nonviolence in Providence. Um, they do a lot of, of nonviolence education that draw on 
And, and the University of Rhode Island also has a nonviolence institute in the summer, drawing on the principles of the blessed community, uh, coming from Martin Luther King and others. So those are all examples of um, that category of sort of nonviolence education, trying to promote the idea that faith should guide people to um, to higher forms of interaction, to to peace, rather than to escalated conflict and and um, harder teams of us versus them. Um, and the the final category that I'll suggest is those that are directly providing conflict resolution and reconciliation services. So a lot of times you'll find mediation centers that do services in a church or in a, in a community center. In Ecuador, there's an organization called FEP um, that's a Catholic NGO that it has presence out in the, the boonies, the rural areas of Ecuador that for many years, they were essentially the only authority figure or institution in those areas. There's an effective absence of the state in those far regions, and they played a role in meeting the needs of those who, who have the most need. Um, right now in the Amazon jungle region, their office has a community mediation center, and they help to provide a service that helps people resolve their conflict without escalating to violence or to the legal system, which can be very costly and inefficient. Um, and, and they do that based on those faith, faith principles. Another example it, it based in New York is the International Center for Ethno-Religious Mediation, ISERM, that does a lot of work bringing different faith groups together around issues of mediation and reconciliation. And finally, Peacemaker Ministries is a group that's based um, in the west of the US and they um, promote um, particularly conflict resolution and reconciliation within the Christian faith community. So sometimes it's between faith communities, sometimes it's within, all right? So there are a lot of different ways that these types of organizations can play a role in fostering peace and resolving conflict. Um, so what about individuals? We talked about the kinds of categories of organizations, but individuals play different roles as well. And I, I, I have names for these. The first, I, I'll call the shepherd. This is someone who resolves conflict within their own spiritual community. They act as a guide and a leader for their own faith community um, to help provide a sort of uh, uh, a direction and a vision of the way that people are called to act in, and behave. So when I started my work in Ecuador with Simproc, I, I grew up Methodist, and so that's my faith community. And so I sought out the Methodist Church in Ecuador. And the Methodist Church leaders um, all, from all over the country actually were the first full-length course, training course that I gave. They participated in a Simproc training, and then they replicated it. Um, we had a group from the, the Methodist Church in Quito, and after going through the program, they then reproduced a version of it to have a sort of Sunday school series for the children in their in their program, and that became a permanent thing that they did. Um, so the pastor of that church took on this role of shepherd, of helping to guide the young people in the church to understand the ways of constructively resolving conflict and, and teaching others about that alternative. Another role would be the bridge. So the shepherd is more within a community. The bridge is trying to cross communities, overcoming intergroup and community conflict, building trust through dialogue and promoting interfaith or intergroup understanding. Um, so in this Colombian refugee project that I mentioned earlier in the, in the Mennonite church, um, we developed a community reconciliation initiative, kind of like a community mediation center, but a bit less formal than that. Um, and we had a training series for the, the refugees themselves because what we were finding is that there were very low levels of trust on the part of Colombian refugees in the formal institutions of the state. I'll show you some data in a minute, but um, the levels of trust, for example, in the police were quite low. Um, the level of trust in the court system was very low. I think about four, three or four percent 
said that they had a lot of trust in the courts. Um, they're coming from a context where state authorities were not their friend. That's why they had to leave Colombia in the first place, because they didn't feel protected, didn't feel like the state was on their side. So it seems like a lot to ask to expect that they would go to the state as their primary source of support once they got to Ecuador. Um, and that was the idea, to develop institutions in non-state actors that they already had higher levels of trust in. I actually, I'll show, again, I'll show the data in a second, but I did a survey of Colombian refugees, and the church was one of the most trusted institutions. And that's true all over Latin America. That's not just for refugees. If you look at what Ecuadorians and other people in Latin America say, the church is generally among the highest levels of trust that they report. So what that group could do is it brought together facilitators who were Colombian, together with co-facilitators who were Ecuadorian, and they could help to bridge the, the gaps between those two communities. They could co-facilitate a mediation or a reconciliation in ways that built trust with the parties that would not be there if it was just someone from one side or the other. Right? So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about it, the bridging kind of behavior. A third one is the advocate. So this is in recognition of, of a context of structural violence. This is someone who confronts injustice, demands accountability, and uses their moral authority to press for social change. In Ecuador, um, there's a very strong indigenous movement. And within that movement, there is actually an evangelical Protestant indigenous movement called Fene. Um, and that actually, that group played a key role in mobilizing the national uprisings that put a lot of pressure on the government to change to more inclusive political forms. Um, <coughs> and to take seriously economic and environmental injustices that were happening, that were happening. And that actually led very, very directly to the creation of a new constitution that enshrined some of those rights in ways that had not been there before. Right, so that's uh, the advocate role. And finally, the model. So this is spiritual leaders who are not so much teaching people to resolve conflict peacefully as they are showing how to do it. So they're initiating often practical projects that aren't even about peace at all. They may be participatory and inclusive, um, like community development projects. You know, build a, a community uh, latrine or um, repave the road that everyone needs to get to market or something like that, um, but include people from all parts of the community, not just one side. And by doing that, they model how cooperation across those differences can make a big difference. And the, the gains that you get out of that are, are worth really trying to understand someone from the other group. Right? So I wanted to lay out those kind of conceptual pieces that we can draw on a bit. So these are, uh, I, I wanna give you a, a few sort of pieces of data. Um, Faith-based institutions play a major role in international development. Oh, there, there's not good data on global faith-based institutions. It's hard to measure because can, that can mean a lot of different things. But for those that are involved in international development but are based in the US, about 60% of them are faith-based organizations. Right? So this is a major component of international development. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the dynamics in Ecuador. Let's um, bring it up a little bit here. So this data here comes from a survey that I did of Colombian, or, well actually any foreigners, migrants and refugees in Ecuador. About 95% or more were Colombian forced migrants. And I asked them about their trust in different kinds of institutions. You may not be able to read the words, but the colors can help you. So the yellow um, bars represent state agencies, like the courts, the police, the Ministry of Foreign Relations, um, the Human Rights Ombuds Office, those kind of things. The green bars are <laughs> secular non-state actors, you know, NGOs, the UN, those kinds of things. And then the blue are faith-based actors. So let's take a look for a second. What do you notice about that graph? 
Anything stand out to you about which types of actors seem to be more or less trusted? Yellow. All right, so the yellow ones seem to be less trusted by this population, and those are the state actors. That's what I was talking about earlier. Um, either low levels of trust. This actually change in trust. I asked this once in 2009 and once in 2013. So not only are they less trusted, but they're getting even less trusted over time. Um, the non-state actors seem to have more trust among, among refugees. Um, the UN system are the very most uh, trusted and, and getting more so. And then groups like the, the church, HIAS is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and the Jesuit Refugee Service are the three mm. faith-based organizations that I have up here. Okay. Um, down here, this is actually data from the U.S. Before you go, yeah. what is the like the left, uh, the right one? Oh, the yeah. one that's. Yeah. So this is interesting. This again, this is change, not absolute levels of trust. This is migrant organizations, so oh. Colombian-led organizations. The first time I asked this question, that was the most trusted. But over time, they have um, really gone downhill. And there are a whole host of reasons for that. Um, some of them are um, sort of economic instability. It's hard to maintain those because you know, the leaders themselves are in very fragile, vulnerable states. And so it's hard for them to maintain a cohesive organizational structure. They're rumors and, and stories that get passed around about corruption, and so that delegitimizes the whole thing. Um, so there are a number of reasons. So that was very sad to me to see that change. And I think that's one, th one role that non-state actors can play is try to fortify and strengthen those kind of grassroots, um, you know, self-led organizations. So thank you for that. Um, down here, this is actually from the US, and it asked people, uh, where have you gotten help to make ends meet? This was a survey in the US. And um, the blue bars are houses of worship, and the, um, the sort of silver bar is, is other sort of secular organizations. And it's by racial group. So we've got white, we have African American, uh, Latino and then other people and there's actually quite a bit of a gap in those who are from Latin America um, they're much more likely to have sought out houses of worship or faith-based organizations for help than any of the other groups so that's an important contextual thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, peace building with this type of population um, finally one other thing I wanted to point out the book project I'm working on now it does a lot with networks that institutions form, the connections that institutions make with each other, and how migrants and refugees plug into those networks. And so I actually asked refugees in Ecuador, where have you gotten help from? If, if you've received any assistance since coming to the US, where did you go to for that help? And they listed them. And so what this shows here is the connections between the organizations that they mention. The, the organizations share the same refugees. The, the dots represent the different organizations, and the line between them mean they have a connection. And the same color scheme applies. So yellow are state agencies. Blue are um, faith-based non-state aid organizations or actors. And the, the green are secular non-state actors. So if you look at this network, I don't know if you can see the colors in the back. I, I know you can't see the words, but um, does anyone see a lot of yellow on this? One, yeah. right? That's the Ministry of Foreign Relations. Um, there are actually um, quite a lot of faith-based actors that are very central to the network. Um, this one is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. This is the Jesuits. Scalabrini, with the, which is a Catholic order, the Mennonite church that I mentioned before, and just church, which people usually think means the Catholic church, but not always. Some of them um, were talking about Protestant churches. Okay, so faith-based actors not only are doing important stuff within their own communities, but they play a really key role in the governance network 
the connection of institutions that provides access to the things that marginalized and vulnerable people might need in order to live happy, peaceful lives. And um, since it's not the focus of this talk, I'll just briefly kind of um, give you a shorthand for what those things are. When we talk about peace building and human security, we're not just talking about stopping someone from shooting you. It's a more holistic concept. And so I've developed this sort of very brief ac uh, acronym or, or idea of, um, of four, three R's and a P, um, rights, recognition, and resources, and then protection. Protection is the traditional thing we think about with security, but if you don't have a security about the rights that you can enjoy, you're very vulnerable. If you don't have a recognition between communities, that often creates insecurity. It makes it less, li more likely that you'll um, lash out against each other. And then the economic part. You know, structural violence is a major component of this. So resources that people need in order to have a satisfying life are important. Because if you aren't sure where you're going to get your meal tomorrow, um, or if you're not sure if you can hang on to your house or the space that you're living in, that makes you, your existence very precarious. It makes you vulnerable to exploitation. In Ecuador, refugees would often talk about um, working for a month, and then the, the boss said, well, I'm not going to pay you. Mm. And what are you going to do about it? If you complain, I'll report you to the authorities and you'll get deported. Um, and the same thing with landlords, um, arbitrarily deciding to evict people. Right? So non-state actors um, are playing a key role in helping to provide access to all of these things. This is the sign for that community mediation center that I mentioned that's in the jungle. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of a sense of my story and how, um, how I got into this. As I mentioned, I grew up in the Methodist Church in Georgia. I understood from that personal experience the value of a positive and fulfilling spiritual community. But I'd heard enough horror stories about um, exploitation and other things to be a bit skeptical about some of the models of foreign missions that I had heard about. There are ways of doing them well and ways of really making damage rather than helping. Um, I traveled extensively during college. I went to the University of Georgia and was part of a program that allowed me to travel every summer and every spring break. And so I got to see a lot of parts of the world. And by doing that, it helped me to understand the social and political hierarchies that produce inequality and violence around the world. Um, I was able to do some independent research one summer in Ecuador. And that introduction really just helped me to fall in love with the, with the country. After I graduated, I went to a symposium in Mexico that brought together people from all over Latin America who were peace builders and conflict resolution professionals. And that moment was inspirational for me. It brought, it not only sort of sparked a desire to start an NGO, but it also um, gave me connections that I'm still drawing on today. I met people in that symposium that actually I'm partnering with in the Summer Institute that I talked about. My co-facilitator from the Ecuadorian University, I met 13 years ago in this symposium, all right? So based on that, I went to Ecuador and decided I was gonna live there for a year and with the goal of starting this organization, CINFROC, which stands for the Center for Mediation, Peace, and Resolution of Conflict. When I got there, obviously I tried to reach out to as many contacts as I had from the last time I was there. One of the friends I had made when I was there doing research in college, when I asked him about this idea, he said, well, you ought to talk with my wife. She's a lawyer specialized in mediation and arbitration. That sounds a lot like uh, what you would uh, find common ground with. And uh, she became the first director in Ecuador of Simfroc. Um, that she helped me run the organization for the first five years. And that actually was instrumental. I'll get a, a little bit later to some of the lessons learned, but um, it is absolutely fundamental to have locally led strategies. I knew that I didn't know enough coming in to have any idea what to tell other people they should do. 
I wanted to use the resources and skills and competencies that I had in order to contribute to a collective effort. And so she was the guiding force. And then after she went on to become the National Commissioner of Mediation and the Human Rights Ombudsman of the country, her replacement has continued to do that. And I rely very heavily on our Ecuadorian staff. Um, they've been the heart of SEMPROC um, and, and their leadership has been essential for its success. Um, I initially partnered with a faith-based organization that uses training and appropriate technologies to increase grassroots development. And that gave me space to learn from them, learn from the people that they were working with, and connected me with key communities and contacts during that first year that I'm, again, still drawing on today. Um, since 2003, Simbrock has trained and served more than 4,500 people um, including children, church leaders, refugees, indigenous communities, the elderly, businesses, teachers, and university students, among others. And this is from probably more than 15 or 20 countries, um, mostly in Ecuador, but people from all kinds of places. In order to give you a real sense of what this is like, I want to brief show you just a, a brief video so you can sort of see it instead of hear it from me. Um, so let me, let me play this for you. I hope you'll be able to read the subtitles in a few of the parts where we're speaking Spanish. Center for Mediation, Peace, and Resolution of Conflict International is an exciting and dynamic organization that is committed to reducing destructive conflict and promoting global peace. CIPROC focuses on providing innovative training programs for leaders at the grassroots level in the United States and Latin America by training community leaders in mediation, negotiation, and communication strategies. CIPROC empowers local actors to become effective peacemakers. Based in Cumming, Georgia in the United States, Simproc is a growing organization led by a dedicated team of volunteers and staff. Through community leader training, children's programs, research, study abroad programs, and mediation, Simproc is partnering with individuals and groups across the globe to resolve conflict and foster peace. Together we're creating peacemakers, one person at a time. Entonces todo era divertido y todos llegamos a unas 
resolución gracias a la mediana. That was from a radio show that was broadcast all over Latin America with this kid. From different groups, we worked with indigenous, we worked with young people, with people of the disability, with young people as well, to comment that the solution to the conflicts is to capacitate and to have better solutions. Oh, that's what we're really all about, is creating a society prepared for peace through grassroots training of community leaders who are the become the resources in their own areas of influence. And um, thankfully, our, the simplified approach that we take is we, we want to figure out when someone's in a conflict, who are they going to go to for help? We want to find those people and train them so that, the, so that they're equipped with the tools and techniques that they need to help others resolve conflicts in a sustainable and effective, peaceful way. En esta comunidad, la realidad conflicto hay entre la familia, entre familias de gustos, a veces por las creencias que nos tierras, terrenos. Entonces hay varias conflictos que tienen podemos colaborar hacia la comunidad. Así yo sé que con este grupo que recibieron durante estos cuatro días o cinco días, creo que se me va a ayudar a solucionar. Eh, el grupo mismo se va a tener la práctica. El grupo mismo ya conoce eh, el camino de solución de conflicto. So these are some of the images from the international education programs that I've run over the years from the University of Georgia, Providence College, and UMass Boston, helping to sort of create these international connections. También tenemos un programa de investigación en fronteras sobre la situación de los migrantes y refugiados colombianos especialmente. Esto a mí en lo personal me llegó muy profundamente, a pesar de que nosotros a veces hemos, hemos crecido con la, con la con, no sé, convicción de que de pronto el colombiano es malo, que el colombiano viene a hacer cosas perjudiciales para nuestro país. Y es como, como algo muy común y, y es como, eh, bueno, todo el mundo cree que eso, eso es lo correcto. Pero al contactar con ellos, al tener con que mirar su realidad, ver la manera como desempeñan su vida, eh, cómo están con sus hijos, de pronto ya deja de ser el colombiano, pero de pronto eh, entiendo que ese se llama Juan. So I'm actually going to follow up on this last point that Omar made. Um, Omar is the director of Simproc in Ecuador. And this idea of reaching out and developing a personal relationship with someone who is different than you is a key part of building peace. It's something that we know works. There's so much ev evidence for this called contact theory and um, creating sort of meaningful um, reciprocal relationships of interaction helps to reduce prejudice between uh, people who are different. So this is back to that bridging role. This is one of the most important things that we can do. Get to know each other. 
right? Build friendships and, and be a positive model for people from other groups because by allowing those relationships to deepen, you promote reciprocal learning and understanding. And the more that you know and understand in individuals from the other group, the harder it is to maintain prejudiced or stereotyped views about the character and motivations of the group as a whole, right? We know that. So this is true in Ecuador as much as it is here in Boston. Uh, I, I actually want to finish by inviting one of my grad students from UMass Boston in the Conflict Resolution Program, Sadi Ahmed, um, to share a little bit about her experiences attempting to bridge differences as a Muslim student um, here in Boston and also previously as an undergrad student at Providence College, a Catholic university. So I'm Sadia, as Jeff mentioned, and I I'm a Muslim and I graduated from a Catholic college. And to give you a sense of kind of the environment of uh, Providence College, I was told by a college official during my junior year that I, by myself, accounted for 20% of the Muslim population. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do the math, it's you know, four other Muslims who self-identify. Oh, so. Wow. It really was an environment where not only on campus students didn't really have the chance to talk to a Muslim, but also a lot of their backgrounds were primarily from white upper class Catholic backgrounds. And so they never really had a chance to interact personally with a Muslim. And this kind of came out as I became involved in campus life and particularly in campus ministry. It came out that a lot of them just never had the chance to interact with a Muslim before. And they found that from what they told me later on, as our friendship developed that they found that that experience of actually knowing a Muslim personally as opposed to having their only source from the media, that that really helped to challenge and counter a lot of the ideas that they had just kind of absorbed, not intentionally, not out of um, any kind of ill will or ill intention, but it's just that was all that was available to them in a sense. And so our friendships and our conversa conversations really helped to kind of challenge a lot of those ideas that they had been given by a source that wasn't really personal, that wasn't really human, which was through the media. Um, and so through those efforts, as well as um, finding that my own Islamic faith was deepening by learning about another religion, I and these students, we were involved with trying to promote this idea of interfaith dialogue that we can approach religious diversity with appreciation as opposed to with hostility or even evangelization. And so I often think about, in this kind of effort that I try to pursue, I often think about a verse in the Quran, which was actually introduced to me by a professor of Catholic theology. Um, and the verse reads roughly, if God had intended, he could have made you a single people, but his purpose is to challenge you and to create a diversity for the purpose of you coming to know one another. And so when I think of kind of the outreach and the peace building efforts I try to pursue, particularly across religious lines, that's the verse of the Quran I think of, that just this idea that there are these religious differences and they are significant, they shouldn't be ignored, but they don't have to result in hostility or in prejudice or in violence that we often see. And so, and that's something that I as a Muslim can choose and I believe that people of all faith can choose to make that choice. So thank you. Okay, so let's open up the conversation for a few minutes before they kick us out for the, <laughs> the next thing. Um, and any uh, discussion or things that came up for you or questions um, about anything that you've heard, Sadia is still here too, so if you have questions for her, she's around as well. Yeah, so Simproc now mostly, almost exclusively works in Ecuador. Um, the U.S. part is basically me, and <laughs> I've had a full time job. So you saw in the video, we have done some programs. Actually, the, the clip that you saw was a, a program where I trained in a Methodist church. Um, some of the Hispanic uh, community leaders who were, uh, were already coming to the church to do the children's program in Spanish, 
uh, for the kids who would come after school or in the ESO program or things like that to teach them about conflict resolution. So that was there. Um, it was more skill-based. We have some other programs that we've worked on. I mean, it had, one of the goals was it, expanding people's circles of empathy to get them to understand um, that the other involves people other than the ones that look like them. You know, that those are people that they should care about too. Um, so the, the social justice and, and racial reconciliation part wasn't as explicit. Um, actually, at UMass Boston, we do have one where it is very explicitly about that. We're having a workshop, and I'll leave some things up here for you, um, on October 22nd, a, a free all-day workshop called um, Difficult Conversations, How to ha Have Dialogue Around these issues of race, uh, religion, and, and identity on campus and community. So more targeted at, at college students and young professionals and recent graduates, uh, but that certainly is a, a focus that's important to me. Others? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. I, I want you to go back to your, you're getting out of college, mm -hmm. and you've been to a symposium in Ecuador, in Mexico. I'm in Mexico, right. but you want to do something in Ecuador. One of the things that we talk a lot about is how do we get the jobs, how do we create, mm -hmm. and it has to be pretty entrepreneurial, which I imagine you did, and how do you leave a place like this and you don't find a little notice that says you got a job in Ecuador setting up a center. <laughs> how did you go about doing that? What, what were the things that, uh, did you wait tables? What, what did you do? Just tell us a little bit about okay. that. So to, to be clear, in, in the University of Georgia, I had a double major in political science and speech communication. I did an internship at the State Department in Washington, DC. And in my head, that was a potential future direction, going into the diplomatic corps or a think tank or a policy job in DC. But that internship actually was helpful in showing me that being a bureaucratic cog didn't um, <laughs> sit so well with my personality. I don't love people to tell me what to do, and I want to have a lot of autonomy and control over the work that I do, and that's the opposite of what you get to do in those big organizations. So um, after that symposium, I was able to find some startup funding, identify an individual and a corporate donor that essentially gave the seed at the beginning um, to get me there. Just you know, basic living expenses for the for several months. And then in order to raise more money, I realized you gotta be a nonprofit organization because people need that most of the time in order to donate. And that doesn't happen automatically and it usually doesn't happen without a track record. So what do I do in the meantime? And so that's where that partnership with the organization that I talked about, the faith-based um, appropriate technologies group is called CFAT, Service in Faith and Technology, came from, they became a fiscal sponsor for that first year where they could receive donations on my behalf and then administer the money um, that were, would allow me to do the programs in Ecuador. And so that's how I sort of, it does take entrepreneurship for sure. I had to go do a presentation for them in their campus in rural Alabama convinced them that I wasn't some yahoo and that I knew something about what I was talking about and build some trust with them for several months. Um, I did an initial training workshop for people that they had from all over the world and then apparently that reassured them and um, we were able to go to Ecuador and I used that year to both develop the programs, write the training curriculum, build relationships and also fundraise. I came back and did a fundraising blitz in May of that, that academic year, and I went to visit a lot of churches, since that was a network I was comfortable with. I visited campuses, um, rotary clubs, you name it, and raised money, do, you know, donations. And for the first few years, that was the major source, was you know, contributions from people in the US, corporate, individual, and, and churches, and community groups. Now it's more a mix of earned income, you know, it's self-sustaining. So things like the study abroad, you know, the people who participate pay a fee and that helps to keep it, keep it going, which is important to have sustainability in the long run. 
but for those first few years, that kind of contribution base was really important. So, right. excellent question. But remember, this happened right after college. Right. So, uh, <laughs> never let someone tell you that you aren't ready, that you're not good enough, that you don't know enough to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of willpower and, and sort of a willingness to put yourself out there. Also humility to know what you don't know, uh, but certainly possible for anybody to do important work. Yes? I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this, some of the ecological conflicts mm -hmm. and um, you know, knowing that you're very grassroots when they start there, but then they, um, the source of the conflicts are often more related to uh, the government or large corporations that are trying to get access to resources. So I wonder if you could say more about how you work with um, ecological um, issues. Sure, that's a, a key conflict that is important in Ecuador. and. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but Ecuador is a major oil producing country, it's an OPEC country, and um, most of it is located in the Amazon jungle, which is where there are a lot of fairly isolated indigenous groups who, are, who live on the land, who depend on it for hunting and fishing and farming and um, their livelihoods, and when oil is extracted, in the 70s there was a major oil spill. Actually, there are constantly major oil spills, but this particular one from Texaco contaminated a lot of um, those resources that people depended on and made a lot of people sick. And so they mobilized. They, uh, I actually had um, one of their, um, their leaders come and talk with one of my study abroad groups about their experience um, putting pressure on people in Quito. You know, they, made it all the way out of the jungle into Quito uh, with full regalia and everything and vi made visible the impact of those damages that were done because it was so easy for oil companies to do what they wanted to because no one was paying attention, right? It didn't affect the decision makers in Quito other than en enriching them. So it really required people to reach out and tap into those circles of empathy that I was talking about, remind people in Quito that, and, uh, and in the US as well, since these were, some of them were American oil companies, um, that their decisions had impact on people's lives who were very much like them, but um, you know, didn't have as much influence over those decisions. Um, now it's mining. There, there is an attempt to diversify beyond oil, uh, but again, that impacts local communities, but the benefits, the economic benefits, are not often shared equitably with those same communities that take most of the burden. And so indigenous groups, again, have mobilized, um, sometimes putting tires across the Pan American Highway in order to sort of mm. shut down the economy until someone pays attention. And sometimes those strategies have been quite effective. Early on in the current political administration, the government of Rafael Correa was sympathetic to that, and people thought that this was gonna be a good alliance. Unfortunately, as he's continued in power, he's become less tolerant of dissent, and so he has criminalized ecological um, mm. uh, protests by indigenous people. The police are often sent and attack them and throw them in jail and they're called eco-terrorists and things like that. So it has actually escalated the conflict sometimes. But it has kept that element of social justice in the public view. So invisibility is the best friend of, of injustice. So by bringing to, the, to light uh, what's happening, that's a key first step. I wonder if you could speak to the nature of the conflicts and about that in Ecuador. Sure. And then um, how you go about, I, I, I believe that trust is a key element mm -hmm. in the work you do. And as an outsider who is working to do peace in an environment like that, how you build the trust that was necessary to make the work effective. Okay, sure. So. 
the kinds of conflicts I was dealing with in Ecuador were often more subtle. So when I was first thinking where I could make a difference, places like Colombia are a more obvious case of conflict because there was a war going on there, a uh, civil conflict. But at the time, there were also more organizations already working there, whereas in Ecuador, there were almost none working on conflict resolution. And I saw that there were still gaps in conflicts. A culture of machismo, for example. Gender-based violence is very common in Ecuador and was then. Um, domestic abuse is very common. Um, discrimination and, and social exclusion of indigenous communities and Afro-descendant communities are very common. Um, racism certainly very common. And these things about environmental conflicts certainly are have, have, have been major parts of those conflicts. So those are the types of conflicts, those social conflicts um, that Simprock has been working on and you know school violence, bullying, things like that is very, very common. When you have structural violence and inequality, um, it often leads to people lashing out and expressing that through you know, hitting their friend in, in school, or even the teachers reproducing the violence. There was a saying, um, la letra con sangre entra, which essentially means people will learn through blood, you know, that you have to beat them in order to get them to do what they need to do. So that was challenging for me coming in, because on the one hand, I saw these structures of injustice that I felt like were not right. Um, when I would do a training with a mixed group, they often would say, oh yeah, things are going all right. But when I did a, a training with only women and there weren't Ecuadorian men in the room, they would often tell a different story and say, you know what, there's a lot of violence that happens here. There's domestic abuse and things like that. So I found that sometimes my role as an outsider actually made people more willing to open up to me than otherwise. Um, I found that sometimes with doing the surveys with refugees. My Omar, my Ecuador director, um, finds that people don't always want to talk to him because they're not sure who he is. He's Ecuadorian, is he possibly another Colombian? Might he you know, be connected to somebody they don't want to have anything to do with? I seem less threatening to them. Um, and so they're more willing to say something to me. On the other hand, I have definitely been dismissed Especially early on, as a young person, people had an assumption that I was this, you know, dumb, naive, clueless American, like so many others, um, and didn't know what I was doing. And um, you, you know, you have to be sensitive to that and respectful of where people are coming from. And I guess the sense of humility was the key tool there of never saying, "Here's what you need to do. Let me tell you," but in opening up a space for dialogue. And so, you know, I have some things that I've, I've, I can bring that um, have worked in other places, and you can tell me how they work here, and I'd love to hear how you're doing it. And let's brainstorm together some, some interventions or some ideas. So I guess that's some of how I've handled that. Yes? Yeah, I, I think it's about your own passion and skill set a lot. I, it bothers me sometimes when people push back against working with groups abroad by saying, well, why are you going way over there? We have problems here. Because the underlying assumption there is, again, defining a circle of empathy. Your circle needs to be here, and why in the heck are you going over there um, to somewhere outside of your circle? And you know, at least within the Christian tradition, that's quite contrary to the biblical teachings of a sort of spiritual community that transcends uh, borders, right? I, I don't think that our circle of empathy should be coterminous with the lines on a map. Um, and so I think that here or there um, is mostly just what interests you, what skills do you have? So for me, being able to speak Spanish meant that I had some value to add that maybe someone else didn't. Um, whereas someone else who, um, I don't know, has a, a dual identity, for example, that they 
were born in the U.S., speak the language fluently, but they have a different religious upbringing. So Sadia has written an article in the Boston Globe that you ought to go check out, where she talks about, and I've got one copy here, um, her identity as both a Muslim and an American. And there's pressure, social pressure, to be one or the other. And she talks about how she has tried to push back on that pressure and say, I can be both and here's what that's about. And so she has a value added here that allows her to be an effective peace builder in this community. Um, and that's something I don't have, right? So that would be a reason for her to focus her work here. Does that make sense? I think we have time yes. for maybe one more question. Well, please join me in, in thanking Professor Pugh for speaking.